Cool. Thanks a lot, JJ. Thanks, everyone, for coming here today, especially for those of you joining us in 3D. It's great to have an in-person seminar again. It feels like the before times, so hope you all agree. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about nuclear power and why I've dedicated my life, and a lot of my colleagues have done the same, because we think this is what's needed to save the world, to combat climate change. It's not necessarily an existential threat, but if we don't fix this climate problem, whatever you feel on the spectrum of is it man-made or is it natural, it is here, and it means that we may be at peak comfort today. Life is going to get a lot harder unless we can drastically decarbonize the electricity and the transportation sector. Now, while nuclear power has the promise to be the biggest weapon we have against climate change, it comes with three main risks. And these have provoked a lot of fear in people, justifiably so. Because even though accidents in nuclear are very rare, they are very consequential. And so at first, I wanted to make sure everyone knew what happened at Chernobyl and what we've learned about designing reactors since then. And then I'm going to get into one of the other risks of nuclear power and what we're doing here at MIT to make sure that this problem doesn't happen. So whenever you bring up nuclear, there are three things, there are three elephants in the room, and we're gonna address two of them today. One of them is nuclear waste. We do make radioactive stuff that has to go in the ground or somewhere for hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of years, and we don't yet know how to deal with it after tens of thousands of years. So I'm not going to address it today, because I don't have any answers. The second one are accidents. There's been three major accidents that uh, to date, there's been Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island in order of decreasing severity. Despite the fact that Fukushima was widely covered, we knew about it exactly when it happened. It was no near, no, nowhere near as bad as Chernobyl, which is why I want to focus on the worst one. Because when you know what happened, and you know how we redesigned reactors to avoid these accidents, you can feel safer in using this as the most potent weapon against climate change. And the third one is nuclear weapons. Because when you enrich uranium, and make plutonium, you produce materials that could be made into nuclear weapons. And so the research we're doing at MIT are new ways of physically verifying how much uranium a state or a non-state actor has enriched in order to root out how many weapons they may or may not have made. So that if you need to make an accusation, you can do so with physical certainty, or better yet, if you can prove that an adversary hasn't made nuclear weapons, you can move towards renormalization of relations with them. And that's where I hope this research is gonna go. But let's start with Chernobyl. I'm gonna to try to teach you what happened in Chernobyl in six slides. And there's not gonna be any math, I promise. I'll start off with the video feed of, from a helicopter in 1986. I was three years old at the time. This was a helicopter feed taken from the Chernobyl reactor after it blew its top. And if you look carefully for the glowing red stuff, that is a graphite and uranium fire smoldering right there in the nuclear reactor. And this was the worst nuclear accident we've had to date. It's hopefully gonna be the worst one we ever have because we've learned a lot from it. And so today I wanna to teach you in the minimum possible technical parlance, why did this happen? So first we have to look at both the physics and then the human factors because in the end, this was a human factors problem. There were lots of physical things that went wrong, but they wouldn't have all gone wrong unless people made mistakes. And these are both individual people and organizations, hierarchical top-down organizations that didn't listen to, th to notifications and warnings from the lower levels of the organization. But this is something we're pretty good at doing here in the US, is having a questioning attitude, taking everyone's concerns seriously, so that things like this don't happen here. So first I wanna show you what a light water reactor looks like. These are the reactors we have churning about in our terrestrial nuclear power plants and in our submarines with an absolutely impeccable safety record. In fact, in terms of quantifying safety by number of deaths per terawatt hour produced, nuclear is bottom out among the safest technologies. It's right down there with wind and solar. It doesn't really cause any deaths. So all these three green technologies, they're equally safe from my point of view. And that's by design. In a light water reactor, you've got a core made of uranium right here, and there are a bunch of pumps designed to make water flow through it, heat up, go through a heat exchanger, and drive a turbine to make electricity. I'm gonna stop there. In an RBMK reactor, the Russian design that Chernobyl was made of, it looks similar, but there's a slight difference. There's the addition of this graphite moderator, which is gonna be the focus of today, and that's the extra part that was Chernobyl's undoing, and we don't have that in our nuclear reactors because 
our engineers knew that this was, could constitute a design flaw. And I'm gonna show you how that played out. First, I wanna introduce one unit of nuclear reactions called cross-sections. These cross-sections, measured in units of barns, give us nuclear reaction rates, and they're important to understand to explain why Chernobyl happened. You might ask, why is it called a barn? It's because most nuclear engineers grew up on farms. Most of our units come from, well, if you couldn't hit the broad side of a barn with a shotgun, you're a terrible shot. So a barn is a large unit of area. It constitutes a pretty decent probability nuclear reaction. Some other examples, the time between when one neutron is born and the next is called a shake, after a shake of a lamb's tail. Has anyone ever seen a lamb shake their tail? No? You guys gotta get out in the country more. It's fast, yeah? Yep. The big lead slugs that we put radioactive stuff in are called pigs because they're big and heavy and don't like to move. The little ones for tiny sources are called piglets. The capsules that we use to shoot pneumatically into the reactor, because they move really fast, they're called rabbits. And so you'll notice a lot of this farm terminology and country terminology in nuclear parlance, but this is all you need to know. And it's important also to know what water and graphite do in a nuclear reactor. The goal of water and graphite is to slow down neutrons because when a neutron flies in and hits a graphite nucleus, it transfers some of its energy to that nucleus, slowing down that neutron. The lighter that element, the more of the neutron's energy can stop. In fact, with water, you can stop neutrons in their tracks, which allows them to participate in the fission reaction. So I'm showing you here is a plot of cross sections for water and for graphite. You'll notice that the absorption cross section is very, very low for graphite and not for water. And this is important to understand why did Chernobyl happen? Because neutrons are born at these very high energies. They bounce around in the water, the graphite in the case of the RBMKs, and in other parts of the reactor, and they slow down to very slow energies where fission happens. And when fission happens, more neutrons are made at the high energies and the cycle continues. And this is what's known as a nuclear reaction. But what happens when the water goes away? In a light water reactor, when the water's gone, the moderator's gone. There's nothing to slow those neutrons down and the reactor naturally shuts itself off. Technically speaking, this is called a negative moderator void coefficient. And what that means in plain English is when the moderator's gone, the reactor turns off. In the Chernobyl design, if the water goes away, the graphite is still there. You still have a moderating medium that keeps that nuclear reaction going, and this was the undoing of Chernobyl. Because while water does help absorb neutrons, if it's gone from that RBMK reactor, you still have the moderation, but you don't have the absorption. And that would lead to a continuous increase in power, which is exactly what happened there. Now there's one other difficulty that I've got to explain, and that there's this other element that's created during fission, that uh, comes out of uranium and it's called xenon. Xenon has cross section of millions to billions of times higher than water and graphite. When you run a reactor for a while, the xenon builds up, but it decays away in about nine hours, kind of on the time scale of two worker shifts, if you notice what's going on here. So we've known for decades, well before Chernobyl, that you have to wait a while to let the xenon naturally decay away before changing the power of a reactor by a lot. Reactors are kind of like Mack trucks. They, if they're going, they don't want to stop. If they've stopped, they don't want to get going. And so the xenon is part of what makes this happen. The mistake made in Chernobyl was that the junior operators were not informed of this xenon poisoning. And so they kept pulling out the control rods to raise the power, fighting against the xenon that was already there. But then the xenon started decaying and the power started rising, so they pushed the control rods back in, and unfortunately, the control rods were tipped with more graphite. So the emergency procedure for the RBMK reactor was to put more moderator into the reactor. It was there for a reason. It helped the moderator rods, the control rods, slide into the reactor, because graphite is pretty slippery, but it caused a 600 times power increase in about four seconds, and that's what caused Chernobyl to blow its top. And so the root cause of this was not really physical things, because these could have been accounted for, but they were human factors. There's a book I'd recommend to everyone called The Culture Map, which tries to rank all the different cultures in the world across eight different axes, things like how deferent to authority they are, how much of a top-down organization it is. And if you plot 
the US and Russia on this map, you can see that the US takes a much more egalitarian approach to decision making. That means that everyone has a say. It's kind of like our democratic process, right? Everyone's got a vote. That includes inside private organizations because we know the value of everyone speaking up. Russia's on the other end. And that's what was the undoing. The senior operator said, do this thing because I command you. The junior said, I don't think that's a good idea. And the senior said, shut up and do it. And then you know what happened next. So we've learned a lot about changing safety culture in the US and around the world. There's a, there's a phrase you'll often hear, which is have a questioning attitude. If someone tells you to do something, you don't say yes. You also don't say no, you just say why. And if you want to challenge someone in authority, no matter whether it's from the bottom to the top, it doesn't matter. The questioning attitude flattens the power structure in an organization and make sure that these things don't happen because you've got now the brains of everyone working together to prevent these sorts of accidents. And this is part of why the US has had reactors churning along for decades. We have an impeccable safety record. Our Three Mile Island accident didn't end up killing anybody. It was a, quite a worry. It caused an evacuation of 150,000 people. But in the end, everyone came together, including some former professors from our department in nuclear science and engineering, who was the CEO of Yankee Row at the time, uh, and prevented that from becoming a real serious accident like Chernobyl. So that's enough for Chernobyl. And now I want to get into the weapons. Or in other words, how do you prevent nuclear power from making weapons? Because if you're enriching fuel for uranium, you could also enrich it to make weapons. But not if the international inspectors have their way. Right now, these safeguards are done by checking people's records, political saber rattling, rattling and all sorts of other things without too much physical verification. But nothing, nothing says it like data. So, we have a project which I like to call the energetic fingerprints of tiny amounts of radiation damage, led by my PhD student, Rachel Connick, um, in order to measure how much uranium did someone enrich if you're given access to their enrichment equipment. The goal here, when we started this project, was to provide a way to verify the US-Iran nuclear deal, which we're no longer in, but I sure hope we will be again soon, because it represents a great chance to normalize relations between our two countries. Shown here is an enrichment plant with lots of rotating drums that are used to enrich gaseous uranium, or uranium hexafluoride. The way it works is they spin really, really fast, sending the heavy, less useful isotopes to the outside, and the lighter, more useful isotopes up the middle, and these are then fed in series to enrich more and more and more until you get to the desired concentration of uranium-235 for your reactor fuel or for your weapons. And the safeguard we're working on relies on the fact that uranium is always blasting the insides of these materials with alpha particles, energetic ions naturally released by uranium decay. If we can scrape off that stuff and put it in some instrument, this instrument is actually just sitting a few buildings down from us on Broadway Street, then we'd have a physical way for the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, to confirm adherence to a non-proliferation treaty and hopefully let some people off the hook if they've been good, or do something else if they've been naughty. At least we would know. To simplify what's going on inside a centrifuge, you can think of it like a hollow tube full of two types of gas atoms, both uranium hexafluoride with uranium-238, or the non-fissile isotope, and uranium-235, or the fissile isotope. And we want to answer two questions. How much uranium was made, and what was its enrichment? Because if we can answer those two questions, we know how much this facility created. It's awfully hard to hide one of these facilities, which might be one of your first questions, is, well, what if somebody just makes a facility and doesn't tell us? We got satellites on those folks. And uh, when you see tons and tons of trucks driving into the side of a new mountain or a new hole in the ground, you get suspicious and you start investigating further, however that happens. And there's three places we can look inside these centrifuge trains. We can look at the centrifuges themselves, let's say the tubes that are interconnected by things. We can look at the stainless steel pipes that connect these centrifuges. And we can look at the Teflon or PTFE gaskets that are used to join these pipes together. The reason we use Teflon is it's a fluorinated hydrocarbon. So all the H's have been replaced with F's and that's awfully good at resisting corrosion from other fluorine. So you need a fluorinated polymer to resist corrosion from a fluorinated gas. We took disks of this Teflon brought them over to our accelerator, 
shown here at MIT, and irradiated this Teflon to some enrichment level doses and tried to see what sort of physical signatures could we detect using thermal analysis or calorimetry. This is a technique which is a heat capacity measurement machine. Whatever sample you want to understand, you put in this one little pan and you have another pan of the same mass next to it. They're sitting on two small furnaces and you measure the difference in power required to keep the materials at the same temperature. That difference in power gives you the heat capacity or the amount of heat it takes to raise the temperature of the material. If you measure the standard heat capacity of the material, well, you've confirmed it. And if you measure a difference after irradiation, that's your signature to clue into. So I want to show you what that signature looks like. So shown here, I'm going to walk you through a calorimetry experiment where we measure the flow of heat into our sample as a function of increasing or decreasing temperature. When you first turn on the instrument, there's a little bit of wiggling going on. The, the instrument kind of gets to know your sample. It adjusts its own feedback coefficients. And then as you continue heating, you measure the standard heat capacity of your material. And then for something like Teflon, which can melt, you can undergo a phase transformation where you can have a large energy absorption or an energy release. Then this is the thing we're going to clue into. You keep measuring to reestablish that physical baseline, draw a background curve. And we found through our experiments that the, the shape doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. And then you can do things to this peak. You can integrate it to figure out the total amount of energy that's been released. You can extrapolate back to figure out the onset temperature. You can deconvolute this peak into elementary thermal processes. And so that's exactly what we did. We took all this Teflon that was irradiated to enrichment level doses down below one bomb's worth of sensitivity. And we can visually see that the signals are different. The difference between the gray and the red well, you can't really see anything, but as soon as you get to 10 to the 9th alphas per centimeter squared, well below one weapon's worth of uranium enrichment, the signals start to separate visually. And as you continue irradiating or enriching, the signal continues to change. And if we process the signal to integrate the area under the curve, we see a very differentiable signal between one weapon's worth of typical reactor fuel, one weapon's worth of the high enriched uranium limit, the limit to which the IAEA says do not go beyond this because it's very easy to make a weapon if you go past it, and the weapons grade material itself. We can be almost you know, three or four standard deviations, sure. Not quite sure enough to make an accusation, but we're getting there. And this is only with 12 measurements. In a real safeguard situation, you would take as many measurements as needed to shrink those error bars down so that you can be as confident as you need to either make an accusation or to lower sanctions which is where I'm really hoping we go with this. Now, how do we sample this in the field? Because this was all done in the lab. Um, something I like to do in my group is get things out of the lab and into the hands of customers, whether that's industry, business, the taxpayer, the international investigator. Within five years, I want it out the door because I need to clear space for the next adventure. And I'd like to change the world somehow. So the damage profile that the alphas give as a function of depth is a flat profile marked by this depth. And the fact that the damage profile is flat and it has a fixed depth gives us some things we can clue into that makes it hard to spoof the signal. So if you were to take a different kind of irradiation or something else and try and fake the signal, there's a lot of features of this curve that make it hard to fake. You'd almost have to get another gasket and put that much uranium in it for that much time. And then you've still got that much uranium and we would know, right? If you switch isotopes, that range, that distance is going to change. If you use an accelerator, the shape of the curve is going to be different. So it's awfully hard to spoof. So what we want to do is be able to extract tiny little pieces of these gaskets, maybe just with a razor blade in the field, bring them back to the lab and dice them up into micron-thin segments, and measure the stored energy of each of these segments. But we have a problem. The mass of these slices is 1,000 times too small for us to measure. So now we have to go into some very recent tech because we're measuring sub-microgram masses. We're talking about nanojoules of energy or less, and it's awfully hard to measure that with a bulk instrument, so we have to switch instruments. Enter nanocalorimetry. It's the same calorimetry as I showed you before, but on a chip. We didn't invent it. We bought it off the shelf. Serial number 21. There haven't been a lot of these made yet, and we're the first people to do this sort of crazy stuff with it. You can deposit your samples on this nanocalorimeter, which is covered in heaters and temperature sensors, so you know what's going on. 
Or you can do what we do and use a focus ion beam to cut out tiny little slices of known size and plop them down on the center. Or you can do what we really do in the lab, which is to pluck out one of your eyelashes, stick it in the end of an X-Acto knife, cut off this Teflon, cut it with a razor blade, make lines of it, continue cutting it more, as is the style of the 1980s, I suppose, and use your eyelash to pick up one of those pieces by static electricity and carefully lay it on this nanocalorimeter chip. So we had to do a couple things to confirm that this technique actually works. We used some standard material that we know very well, in this case, pure indium metal. We measured the stored energy of melting and freezing of this indium, and based on its known enthalpy of fusion, we can get its mass. We also looked at it in the electron microscope, and just by measuring its dimensions, like with a nanoscopic ruler, we get the same mass. So we know this technique returns the correct energies. By switching instruments, we have not changed the answer. And that's important for translating the science from our lab to other people's labs. And finally, I'm happy to say that after we found the one way you can spoof this by getting a uh, disk of polonium metal, which shoots alpha particles in all directions, irradiating some Teflon, using a diamond microtome to slice off pieces of the sample. This is the same kind of knife that we use to cut cells into slices so that you can see the organelles and other things inside. And we put these on the nanocalorimeter chips. We repeated our same experiments and got largely the same results. So what's most important here? There's three things to note. One of them is our measurements in the big DSC and the nano DSC are almost the same, represented here by the blue lines. The spoof-proof nature of it is that it's flat. The profile is roughly flat, and this is only five measurements. With more measurements, those error bars will collapse. And we see the energy drop off exactly at the range of the alpha particles that the polonium gave off, Repro reproducing all three features of the curve and giving the IAEA hopefully a physical tool that they can use to verify whether or not some of our adversaries or frenemies or whoever you might be talking to have or have not made as many weapons as they say. And that's the little way in which my group is hoping to save the world. So I'll stop there, and I'll take any questions you might have about Chernobyl or enrichment. Yes? has not been developed in the US for many years. Mm -hmm. When it is expected, if at all, that this industry would re be renewed in the US? Sure, so the, the question was, we haven't seen a fission reactor built in a very long time here. When is the industry gonna be renewed? Five years. Five years? There are some new advanced reactors that have uh, not only have companies, billion dollar companies signed up to make them, but local municipalities have agreed to have them built. The, um, the X Energy XE100 is gonna be built in Washington State. Terra Power's natrium reactor, which uses liquid sodium, is gonna be built in Wyoming. Kairos's molten salt reactor is gonna be built in Oak Ridge. And I don't mean gonna maybe kinda like they are already going through the process. China commissioned 400 uh, new, small nuclear power plant from Westinghouse mm -hmm. is, uh, with interchangeable part, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So if China accepts it, or it's accepted there, what is the problem of approving it here? So we have a much stricter regulation system here than in China. There's a few things that are, let's say, there's a few things that are different about the US and China. Here we have, the one of the world's strictest regulation systems, and that's to our credit. While it does make it awfully hard to build a plant, we know they're gonna be safe. I can't speak for the Chinese regulator. In addition, if the central government of China says, go do this, let me go back to that hierarchical chart and you'll see where China is compared to the US. I think we can answer this once again with the culture map. China is one of the few countries that's even more hierarchical than Russia. This I view that might be a problem because if people can't speak up against their superiors, if they're even superiors, then you have to question you know, what's happening at every level of the organization. But it means they can be quicker. It means that the central government says do this and it will get done. But at what cost, with what safety standards, we have yet to find out. That's another reason, by the way, we need to build reactors in the US because since the nuclear age started, the US has been the world's technological leader when it comes to everything nuclear. We have lost that position. China and Russia are poised to overtake us. We need to gain it back for the safety of the planet in many ways. 
I know you said you uh, don't have an answer to the waste problem, but um, mm -hmm. wh where where is the waste going aside from what is it the mountain in in uh, Utah? Sure. So the question was, what are we actually doing about the waste? Where is it going? Right now, most of the nuclear waste is sitting out in the open on sites in basically impenetrable canisters. And I recommend you look up some YouTube videos about testing these canisters, where they've put them on two locomotives going at 60 miles an hour with a bunch of spikes filled with jet fuel so that they explode. They are safe, but they are just sitting out there. And Yucca Mountain, the hollowed out mountain in Nevada that Nevada ended up not letting happen, is still sitting empty. That is one potential geologic repository. There's also the waste isolation pilot plant where we do send some nuclear waste. But in terms of what to do 10,000 years in the future, when none of these countries may exist, we may not even speak the same language, we may be evolutionarily distinct from humans as we know today. The National Labs did commission a study to talk about how do you communicate to a group 10,000 years in the future. And they, someone produced a documentary called Containment. It's an absolutely apolitical take on this question. How do you warn people 10,000 years in the future about the dangers of nuclear waste? It doesn't take a side. It just explores the question with a, with a group of scientists, artists, philosophers, humanists, linguists, and everyone in between. <laughs> I don't hope Facebook won't be around in 10,000 years. I got off it 10 years ago when I saw the stuff people were saying about Fukushima. That was my cue to exit. Yeah. Yeah. Question over here. I'll bring the mic. So um, here's my question. I wanted to find out, um, since the growth rate of this particular market segment is really slow compared to other renewables, mm -hmm. how do you foresee this in the near future versus the short term? Um, the growth rate, because I mean, if someone is going to invest, you want to know how it's going to perform in the next uh, coming years. Mm -hmm. The second question is, I mean, there are a lot of technology right now in terms of like nuclear batteries and all that. Do you foresee a kind of synergy between the project you're doing and some of the, the technologies, also some of them coming from MIT? Thank you. Sure, so I'll answer the questions in the order they're received. What about the growth rate of the nuclear industry? Because it's been incredibly slow. It's about to get a lot faster. Since we now have, well, there is an ecosystem of nuclear startups. I, could, I couldn't say that when I joined the field, and that wasn't even that long ago. So it's a poise to accelerate enormously because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has committed to a licensing pathway for advanced reactors. They're holding themselves to the standard to say, if companies come to us with a new design, we promise we will get back to you in a timely manner whether you can license it or not. And there are companies lining up. There are some making small modular reactors, and there are some making larger reactors. So I'd put X Energy in kind of the medium couple hundred megawatt level. Kairos power may be on the larger scale. And there's some that are as small as one megawatt, kind of a reactor you could fit on a truck, like the Ivinci reactor from Westinghouse. So the fact that license applications are going in, pre-licensing applications are going in, and local municipalities are agreeing on siting, that's the signal that the market's poised to accelerate. So at this point, the momentum is huge, and barring some crazy catastrophe, I think it's unstoppable. Whereas the, the way we were going about it 20 years ago with the AP-1000 reactor, the reactor that was so big that nobody could afford to buy it, well, nobody could afford to buy it. And so Westinghouse only sold a couple. Um, that, in my opinion, was a mistake to go gigantic, because if you talk to the utilities, who are the customers of nuclear plants, right? We're not the customers of nuclear plants. We just take the electrons out of the wall and then give them back. Um, the utilities don't want gigantic gigawatt electric plants. They want something smaller, more load following, more dispatchable. So the new nuclear companies have listened. They're listening to the voice of the customer. And that match between supplier and demander is what's going to make this market accelerate. Could you remind me of the second part again, please? Absolutely. So um, it always puzzles me when people fight over which green technology is the one that's supposed to save the world, nuclear or wind or solar. Just replace that with an and. You're right. That synergy is what's needed here. There's a place for solar. There's a place for wind. There's a place for nuclear. Together, they can solve the baseload power problem, the peaking power problem, the energy storage problem. And this shouldn't be a fight. This should be a journey together. 
So I saw a couple other hands, yeah? Yeah, one more, and then we'll have to transition to our next talk. Uh, so in the scheme of miniaturization, uh, how small could you know, one of these reactors get? Could you put one on a car? You know? Good question. So the, the sort of academic flights of fancy have always said, let's, let's get nuclear-powered cars. I don't think that's going to happen. Because while you can make a nuclear reactor really, really small, the safety systems around it take up some space. But you could put one on a truck. So a sort of one megawatt scale truck could replace a one megawatt scale diesel generator on a truck without the emissions. And so that's the market for these tiny single megawatt reactors is places where it takes 10 gallons of diesel to deliver a gallon of diesel. Remote villages in uh, the Northwest Territories, sort of fishing villages in Alaska where you don't even have road access. There are places where nuclear power can, let's say a megawatt of nuclear can offset 10 megawatts of diesel emissions because of how hard it is to get the fuel there. Okay, I, I think this has been great. So many things to think about and thank you for your questions. Thanks a lot everyone.